Welcome to the first part of our four-week series on disability, accessibility, and Jesus. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus teaches on the inclusivity of the kingdom. When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. And then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. Jesus. Hi friends, I'm so looking forward to this series and we are going to today dive into this passage that we've just read. And we're going to hear from a special guest, Dr. Lamar Hardwick is going to be with us today via video. Uh, just some words of introduction, first of all, for the whole series. I am very much looking forward to something that we do annually at this time, at least we have for the last few years. And that's during our Peacemaker campaign. We also have a Peacemaker series and we have been um, regularly making a positive habit of inviting underrepresented voices in the church to become more centralized. We've talked about racism and women in leadership and people with um, mental illness. And this year we are talking about people with physical and developmental disabilities, underrepresented voices that we want to acknowledge as brother and sister, as family, and learn from and learn with. It's gonna be a good series. Um, first of all, I wanna say hi to Marianne. Thank you, Marianne, I'm looking down here because that's where you are on the screen for me. Hi, Marianne. Let me try something. Uh, let me say hi. Uh, my uh, name is Brexy. Uh, that, Jimmy just made up this sign for me, Marianne. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's close to a sign for the beard with a B and that's, that's what Jimmy says is now my, my sign name. So I love that. Thank you, Jimmy. Um, all right, so <clears throat> let me share a few thoughts and then we will get um, Dr. Hardwick on the screen and we're gonna listen and learn from him. I wanna be clear that this series is about kingdom community, not church charity. This is not about us as the church learning how to be more embracing of those people, whoever those people are. Uh, it is always about us being ourselves, being the alternative society and growing together. I hear from some people with disability that it is possible for them to move through this world, always being reminded that in some way, this world was not made for them. Now, when I say that, I mean not God's creation, the world, but I mean our human creation, society, that in many ways, our civilization, our society is built with a default, what some call the cult of normalcy, the, the ableism, that sense, the bigotry that says there is a default to what humanity should be. And then we will also make room for we will make accommodations for those people who don't fit 
the norm. We do this with our physical structures, building buildings and automobiles for able-bodied people, and then making accommodations, uh, a ramp or um, hand controls for people who, um, who can't walk. And there's a constant reminder for some people with a disability that, that they're being accommodated, but not fully welcome. In a series like this, we want to, um, we want to reestablish the fact that uh, we're family. And it's not about us as an able-bodied family learning to relate to others, but rather we want to pull everyone close and learn from one another in new ways. Um, the church itself should be an alternate society, an alternative society, a different way of being. Now, I have to say upfront that uh, this is baby steps for me. Uh, this is a new way of learning, a new, uh, a new area of focus, and one that for us as a church, we are still learning in and that I especially am still learning in, but I'm excited what I am learning and I'm excited to bring it to you throughout this series. Next week, I'll be teaching. The week after that, we're gonna hear from Jimmy and then I will wrap up the series as well. But we're also gonna have um, guests each week uh, in, in, in the form of interviews, members of our church community and some beyond. And as I mentioned today, we're gonna hear from... Uh, from one special guest from the States. Uh, besides all of this, not only do we wanna break down the divide between us versus them, we wanna remind us all that this is ultimately a series about us being our best selves because we're all in some way, shape or form on the continuum of disability. We, we as a species are born uh, with a lack of ability to fully function. Not like some animals who out of the womb, they need to stand up if they're gonna nurse and then move on with the herd. Human beings come out half-baked. We take time. We don't, we're not fully abled from the beginning. And all of us, or at least most of us, will probably die after a season of prolonged and increasing disability. And then in the meantime, we all struggle with a, a lot of lack. There's only been, um, a, well, Adam, Eve, and Jesus as far as perfectly functioning human beings on this planet. And even so, we're ultimately gonna be able to fly. That's my takeaway from the ascension. If, if the ascension gives us a peek at the resurrection capabilities of our new bodies, one day we're all gonna be able to fly and we can't in the meantime. So we're all in this together and we're all going to learn from one another on how we can be the alternative society, the kingdom community. Now, with that in mind, I love how Jesus, when he talks about the kingdom, he has a key word that he often uses. It's the word repent. Sometimes he'll say repent and believe. He says that in Mark 1, 15. And sometimes he'll just say repent, but he uses this word repent when the topic of the kingdom comes up. For the kingdom of heaven is near, so we should repent. Or the kingdom of heaven is at hand, so we should repent and believe. Or, or the, the kingdom of heaven is approaching. Uh, the word repent, it sounds like a religious word that we only use in the context of being sorry for our past. You should repent of your sins. Jesus does use the word that way sometimes. But interestingly, more often than not, Jesus uses the word repent, not in connection with our past, but in connection with our future. He attaches the word to how we should respond to the coming kingdom. It's a very positive word. It literally just means to rethink. Repent uh, is literally the, the Greek word for rethinking or thinking again over something. Jesus says, in light of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven on earth, in light of this new way of living that I am bringing into our lives, you're gonna have to rethink some things moving forward. There are things we regret about our past that we repent of, but really this is a series of repentance looking forward, saying how can we manifest, experience and extend the kingdom of Christ in a more real and palpable way. Uh, so where are we headed in this series? Just before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Lamar Hardwick. Um, 
Well, we've already had our Ears to Hear event. We've been having these each year as we do this Peacemaker series, which uh, gives a chance for us just to get together and have open, open mic and listen to people. And this, this year's Ears to Hear with hundreds of people joining us online uh, for our Ears to Hear. It was a fantastic event, just uh, listening to people discuss what life is like for them with their disability, whatever it may be. And for that, and for much of this series, the modest goal is just simply cultivating family-styled empathy to understand one another better. Um, then for this series, we're not only gonna have our Sunday teaching complete with sermon notes, which I hope you folks are opening and you're, there's more information about uh, Lamar, we're on a first name basis now, Dr. Hardwick in the notes and um, also where he's headed in his teaching. Um, so you can open up your notes through a tab on your computer or maybe you're using the Meeting House app. Um, so there's notes and interview, and then interviews. We're going to each week, this week we're, we have a special guest and then every other week of the series, we're going to be um, hearing from uh, folks in our community with disabilities, both physical and developmental on what life is like for them. We just wanna get to know them better. The after party, which is happening throughout the series, but not today. Am I right? Not today? Yeah, not today. Uh, today we have local lobby time at the end of the teaching. So we won't have an after party today. Then every other week of the series, we have an after party and we'll have guests on there as well for us to talk together about uh, the kingdom of God on earth. And then uh, home church. This is gonna be an important series for you to join a home church. All our home churches are online. The information is all on our website. And I know any home church would be happy to have new people join for this series. So if you want to engage fully and learn together, I think turning this monologue into dialogue so that you can participate in the learning actively would be fantastic. So we encourage you all to sign up for a home church if you aren't already in one and to make that part of your learning for this experience. All right, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Hardwick. Um, I be became aware of uh, Dr. Lamar Hardwick when doing a research for the series. Someone uh, turned me on to his writing and his, uh, he's written a number of books. Um, his latest book, which comes out February 9th. Is today the 8th? I think. No, what's today? Seven. Today's the 7th. Yeah. It's in two days, in two days. His his book comes out, uh, Disability and the Church. Um, this is his third, his latest book. And um, we've got a special um, way in to help you get a uh, uh, discount. If you go to parasource.com, we have this information on the screen. If you go to parasource.com, that's the Canadian distributor for Christian books. If you go to them directly, parasource.com, and, uh, and when checking out, you use the... Uh, code Hardwick40, you'll get 40% off the book. We want to make sure that we equip you throughout the series. There's other things in your notes, videos that you can watch uh, that are in the notes. So we want to make sure you feel well equipped throughout the series. But uh, reading Dr. Hardwick's latest book, which I've had a chance to read an advanced copy, I think is going to be a great way of kind of entering into the discussion. All right, so you've got your Bibles open, hopefully to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, around verses seven to 23. And um, we're gonna turn it over now to this new friend of the meeting house and brother, uh, Dr. Lamar Hardwick. He's the lead pastor at Tri-Cities Church, uh, just in um, uh, East Point, Georgia. And he's uh, someone who himself lives with a disability and is... Uh, written extensively, done lots of research and has lived experience on the topic. We could think of no better way to start this series. So let's listen to our new friend, Lamar. Let's turn it over to him. Well, good morning, Meeting House. And shout out to Bruxy and all the leaders uh, at the Meeting House. Man, I am excited about the opportunity to share with you today you guys are a phenomenal church and doing a phenomenal work in advancing the kingdom of God. And so I'm thankful for this opportunity to come and share with you this morning. Well, as he stated, my name is Lamar. I'm the lead pastor at Tri-Cities Church in the United States in the Atlanta, Georgia area. And we have such a wonderful and unique community here that I'm so privileged and blessed to be a part of. So many of you may have never seen or heard my story online, and some of you perhaps have heard or seen my story online. Online, most people know me as the autism pastor. 
Here's why. After years of silently struggling with sensory processing challenges and social anxiety and uh, a host of other issues and relationships, uh, I was diagnosed on the autism spectrum in December of 2014, and I was 36 years old when I was diagnosed. Now, I always hear people ask, how is that possible? There's a number of reasons why uh, perhaps I went undiagnosed. But here's what's important, that around the age of seven or eight years old, I knew that there were some differences between me and other children. Uh, I often had to fake understanding things that I didn't really understand. And I didn't know what to do to fit in, but I knew what not to do to be singled out. And so I sort of flew under the radar for years, struggling with things that I didn't have a language to be able to describe. And then in 2014, I hit what I call the proverbial wall. Uh, I was really challenged at the time in my ministry and with work. And it just seemed like I was hearing descriptions of people's interaction with me. Um, similarly to how I used to hear the same sort of reports of relational interactions with me as a child, except now I was hearing it in what I called adult language. And eventually I discover that all these people can't be wrong, that there's something that they're experiencing with me that I'm not understanding their experience. And so it led me to a very important question that I had to ask myself. And I think this is an important question, not just for myself, but all of us who follow Christ. And it's particularly important for us as those who are called to be his church. And that question is this, what do people experience when they experience me. Yeah, I had to come to the conclusion that while there was a presentation of myself that I thought people were experiencing, that it wasn't quite the same way when they stood on the other side of me. And I want to contend this morning that maybe it's the same way for persons in the disability community or persons who are differently abled have an experience with the church that might not be exactly what we think it is. There's a story of uh, a Christian school that was wanted to appreciate his students. And so they were planning to put on this huge feast to celebrate their students. And there was one particular teacher who knew that she had some greedy young men in her class. And so in order to make sure that they didn't eat all the fresh fruit that was laid out on the table for this feast, she wrote a handwritten sign that said, take only one apple, God is watching. Well, one of the little boys runs down and he sees a note about only taking one apple and he studies the note. He looks at the apples and then he runs down to the other end of the table where there was a plate of warm, fresh baked chocolate chip cookies. And he runs back down to the other end and looks at the apples, runs back down to the other end of the table, looks at the cookies. And then he runs back to his friends who were all staring at the apples and says, hey, guys, Let's go down and get some of the chocolate chip cookies because God is watching the apples. <laughs> and while that's a pretty hilarious story, it does say something about how God views how we set the table. And so I want to read just a little bit of Luke chapter 14 because Jesus also tells a story about a banquet while he's at a banquet, a feast that is put on that Jesus is invited to. Listen to Luke's words in Luke chapter 14. I'm going to read verses 7 through 14. Here's what Luke says. When Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. When you're invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What of someone who is more distinguished than you who has also been invited? The host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you will be embarrassed and you will have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he will come and say, friend, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exhausted. And then he turns to the host and he says something really interesting that I want you to pay attention to. Verse 12, then he turned to the host, 
When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then, at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Let's stop right there. So Jesus, as Luke records, is invited to this party. He's invited to this party that's given by some Pharisees. And when Jesus gets there, he notices that everybody is looking for an opportunity to seat at the seat of honor. Now, what happened prior to this, what I didn't read is that they had also invited a man with dropsy. A dropsy is sort of what we would consider today something like congestive heart failure. It causes his limbs to swell. And what Luke records is that they actually invited this man there to see if Jesus was going to, in fact, heal this man on the Sabbath. In true fashion, they were trying to trap Jesus to see if Jesus was going to break any of their religious laws. And instead, Jesus dismisses the man after he heals him and then goes on to this discourse to talk about how to set the table when you are inviting someone into God's kingdom. You notice that Jesus says, do not invite your brother or your sister or people who can repay you. Instead, he says to invite those who are on the margins. Particularly, he says, I want you to invite those persons who are lame or crippled or blind, those persons who are differently able than you. You know, there's a reason why Jesus actually says this is the way that you set the table. There's an, an old story, many of you have heard this before, of a philosophy professor who goes into his class and he puts uh, a big glass jar on his desk and fills it with rocks and asks his class, is this jar full? And of course they say, yeah, it's full. And then the story goes on to say that he fills it with tiny pebbles and then he fills it with sand and so on and so on until he finally shows and makes the point to his students that there's always room for more when you start with the right things. And I think this is what Jesus is saying when he's talking about setting the table for inviting people to this grand feast. So there's many reasons why I think that we should really consider as those who follow Christ, how have we set the table when we're inviting persons to be a part of this grand feast that Jesus is inviting us to as a part of his kingdom? You notice that Jesus has a way of helping us to understand that perhaps the reason why it's been so difficult in the past to fit in the disability community is because perhaps we've started it wrong. You notice what he says? He says to invite the poor, the lame, the crippled. Don't invite persons that can repay you. Instead, when you build the table, when you're building the church, when you're inviting people to be a part of my kingdom, start with the most important community first, the community that's most often left on the margin. You know, there's some statistics that show that for most people in the disability community, being a part of the church has actually been something that has been a struggle. There's some statistics that show from our friends at Understood, which is an organization who provides data and resources to families who are on the margin. Listen to these statistics. And this is the percent of increase for not attending church. That there's a 19% increase, increased chance of not attending church for a family that has a child or someone who has ADHD. So 36% chance, 36 chance that a family will not attend church if they have a child or a family member that has a learning disability. It's a 45% chance that a family will not attend if there's someone in their family that has an anxiety disorder. 55% chance increased of not attending church if someone in their family is impacted by a conduct disorder of any kind. And then there's an 84% chance that a family will not attend a local church 
if someone in their family is impacted by autism. That app report also goes on to say that 56% of families actually kept their children out of religious activities due to lack of support from the church. And 46% have never even been asked how to include their child or their loved one. And Jesus is very clear that when you build a banquet, you have to start with those who have been on the margins. So I think there's a couple of things that we can learn and maybe even more importantly, a couple of things that we can do to be a church that starts in the right place, that builds the table, that extends grace and love, compassion and inclusion to those in the disability community. Number one, the reason why we should do it is because it invites God's blessing. Did you catch what Jesus said? Maybe I should read it again. It's in Luke chapter 14 again, when he says in verse 12, when you put on a luncheon or banquet, he says, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back and that will be your only reward. In other words, Jesus says that when we fail to reach out to those who are on the margins, in this case, those who are in the disability community, he says our only reward is the people who are already attending. Instead, verse 13, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. In other words, Jesus says that when you invite those who are on the margins, those who are in this unique community, you also invite God's blessing into your gathering. You invite God to bless the table that you're setting for those who are different from you. Do you catch what he said? That God himself will be the one who rewards you and repay you for setting the table properly. So one of the main reasons why we should be more inclusive of those with, who are differently able is not only does it invite them, it invites God to bless the table that we're setting. And Jesus is very clear that God himself will add more value to the work that you do, the prayers that you pray, and the ministry that happens when you set the table by inviting those who are on the margins. In this case, Jesus says, invite the blind, the lame, the crippled. Invite those who are differently able and watch God's blessing also accept the invitation to the table. The second reason why this should be extremely important for every church and every Christian is because it reinforces our commitment to the gospel. You know the story in Luke chapter 15, just one chapter away from what I just read. when Luke records Jesus telling the story about a missing sheep. And in that story, the shepherd goes after the one sheep that is missing. Here's what he says in verse four. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go to search for that one that is lost until he finds it? My brothers and sisters, if there's any group that's been missing from the local church, it's been the community of those who are differently able. In fact, here in the U.S., about 20% of the people are recorded as having some form of either intellectual, developmental, or physical disability, yet only 2% of churches even have some sort of ministry that tries to accommodate them. If it's true what Jesus says that the shepherd goes after the missing sheep, then one of the goals of the church should always be to ask the question, who's missing? One of the groups that's missing are the people in our community who are impacted by disability. And our mission as a church is always to go after who's missing. When Jesus says to set the table, he says to set the table and to go after those who are missing from the invitation list. The blind, the lame, the cripple, those who are on the margins those who have not always been invited or included to have a place at the table. Invite them first, Jesus says. And that reflects our commitment to the gospel to go out and to find out who's missing from our congregation. Who's missing that should be here and be a part of the table that Jesus is setting. So not only does it reinforce our commitment to the gospel, 
But have you ever considered this, that the church was actually born for inclusion? Yeah, you remember, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 9, he's 19, that he will give the keys to the kingdom of heaven to the local church. Here's why I'm so passionate about this. Because there is no plan B. And Jesus says that he's given the keys to the kingdom, the access to his kingdom, the invitation to his table was given to the church. And it's the church's job to go out and find and invite people in. In other words, the church was born to include those who are on the margin. We hold the keys. And Jesus is holding us responsible for being inclusive of those who have been missing from having a seat at the table. See, diversity includes the disability community. Access to God's kingdom requires that we invite those who are on the margin. And then finally, one of the reasons why it's so important for us as a church to continue to be not just those who invite, but those who include persons who are dis- who have disabilities or who are differently abled. It's because when their voice is absent from the church, there's a void that's present. I'll say that again. When their voice is absent, a void is present. Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 22 through 26. He says, in fact, some parts of the body that seem the weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts so that that should not be seen while the more honorable parts do not require the special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for the harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are honored. Paul is very clear that inviting those parts to the body to send the invitation to the banquet for those who are on the margin is to, in fact, bring harmony into the body. It's almost to say that when the differently abled are missing from our churches, there's actually a void that is present. Because their voice is missing. You know, Jesus goes on to tell a story. He tells a story about a banquet at the banquet. And he says this, that a man prepared a great feast and set out many invitations. And when the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. But they all began making excuses. One said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. And his master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And after the servant had done this, he reported, there is still room for more. You know, when I have conversations with a lot of my pastor friends and professors and theologians, It's very rare that the subject of disability inclusion comes up in our theology, in our planning, in our process, in our programming. And most of the time, it's almost though it's very difficult to fit the discussion of disability inclusion into the conversation of the church. But what if Jesus is telling us that's because we built it backwards? Did you notice what he said? In the second story, he sends out the servant, to invite those who are on the margins, those who are differently abled. And when the servant comes back after inviting all of the people who are part of this unique community, he says something that's extremely important. There's still room for more. In other words, when we start in the right place, it helps us stay on the right path. And when we start with the community that Jesus is calling us to send an invitation to, there's still plenty of room for everything else that needs to take place in the local church. Listen, this is just the beginning of a great discussion about what it means to be more inclusive of those persons with disabilities in our communities. And so if you're listening to this, you probably 
have a heart for those who are on the margins, but you also may need some help. And so would you do me the honor of praying with you as we all around the world band together as Christ followers to send out the invitation and to invite those on the margins to God's table. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for inviting us to your table. Now, God, help us to be keenly aware of our need to invite those who are differently able to be a part of the grand feast that you are preparing for those who call on your name. God, we thank you and we love you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's it's uh, been an Ottawa themed day. Marianne is also in Ottawa doing our ASL. So appreciate everyone's participation. Uh, Ottawa and Georgia has been our locale theme. Speaking of which, we are going to break off into our local lobby time where we kind of give each other an opportunity to simulate hanging out after the service and getting to know some people and connecting with our lead pastor over our parish area. In order to do that, <clears throat> You're going to head back to the Meeting House website. If you're, if you're on YouTube, come back to the Meeting House website and click on the teaching. Um, and maybe that's where you're watching it now. If you scroll down that page of, of the local live stream, if you scroll down, you will see a number of different links to by, uh, by parish, by area. And, um, and if you click on one of those, it'll take you into a Zoom call. And in a few minutes after we end, you'll have a chance to hang out, to know and be known and build some community there. If you are watching from a distance and you say, um, I'm not really part of any Meeting House parish geographically, relationally, um, I'm far away, then there is one of those links that just says online. And if your only connection with us is online because you are removed geographically, then go there and we have an online parish. Otherwise, even if you haven't, you know, you've just joined us during this time of COVID while we have been all online, still find one that's closest to your geographical area so that when we do get back together again, when we do have home churches and do have opportunities for in-person ministry, you're already building relationships with people who are closest to you. That's where we're headed. I'll tell you, I, I take away uh, something, um, well, a number of things from what Lamar said, but what's just ringing in my ears is that we've built the church wrong. We've built the church wrong. We've, we've bought into the philosophy of our secular society, which has ableism at its center and the cult of normalcy. We've, we've built the church with a default setting of what is normal and then considered reaching out to people with disabilities as a kind of charitable, a char charitable work. It's, a, it's our charity. Whereas rather we wanna be the kingdom and we want to rebuild the church properly. And so, as I said, this will be a series of repentance for us and that's an anticipatory word of what lies ahead. I'm so looking forward to how we're all gonna learn and grow over the weeks ahead. Well, Lamar has prayed for us. I'm so grateful for him and for his teaching today. What a great way to start the series, but we've prayed. And so we're just gonna dismiss you now to head off into lobby time with your local parish. Bless you, have a great Sunday. Hi, I'm Rexy. Thanks for tracking with the Meeting House teaching. If you want to see more videos by us, just click right here. If you want to see what our youth and our kids are learning, you click here. And if you want to be notified anytime we post a new video to make sure you don't miss a teaching, then you subscribe by clicking right here. Thanks again for tracking with us.